Welcome to another episode of Brewing the Facts. I'm your host and home brewer, Anthony Ozzo, and today we will see fermentation in action and also get to the dry hopping and racking uh, into the secondary vessel uh, that will finish the maturation of the beer uh, that is going to be so delicious before bottling. Once again, for those tuning in for the first time, I'm making a Scottish export ale modeled off of the seventh doctor in classic Doctor Who, Sylvester McCoy. It's called Fenric's Revenge, a roasty PD and malty Scotch ale. Of course, the primary vessel had the yeast added last time and was stored in a place to keep the temperature between about 65 and 70 degrees. But before uh, you get to see the formation of the Krausen, oh, who doesn't like that? Let's have some fun and learn about how beer has not only intertwined itself into our lives through its delicious flavors, but also through our speakers. know at least one drinking song and many have been a part of many sing-alongs as they swayed and swung their drink back and forth. The drinking song was meant to celebrate a community of people. The melodies are simple, the lyrics are repetitive enough that they are easily learned and remembered, they can convey happiness or even bring tears to your eyes. And your singing voice doesn't matter as everyone is usually slurring or too buzzed to even know you have a good voice. And of course, the songs come from decades and even centuries ago, a simpler time before autotune and AI, as we can now turn a bathroom singer into a virtuoso. From Ein Prosit, which was an Oktoberfest staple in 1912, to the 1969 The Clancy Brothers masterpiece, Beer, 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 to the Italian classic from the 1880s, Bevelo Tutto, drinking songs from many cultures and times are still done today even if some are modernized. Many drinking songs were more like spoken word poems and chants the further back we go, and of course we can get really modern with songs like Beer by Real Big Fish, These Exiled Years by Flogging Molly, well, many songs by Flogging Molly, and You, Me, and the Bottle by Big Bad Voodoo Daddies. But how long ago can we find evidence of drinking songs? If you guessed 11th century, you are very into drinking history. That's right, a document known as the Carmina Burana, which was a manuscript with over 250 poems and lyrics from the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, contains what is believed to be the first record of a drinking song. There were several excerpts from this document with body tales, many containing satire. For example, some songs are about priests with their wives, drinking wine and sleeping in. Of course, in the Catholic Church, this would be bad behavior for a priest. One famous poem in the document that was later put to music includes lyrics. First of all, it is the wine merchant. The libertines drink. One for the prisoners, three for the living. Four for all Christians, and five for the faithful dead. Six for the loose sisters, and seven for the footpads in the wood. Eight for the errant brethren, nine for the dispersed monks. Ten for the seamen, eleven for the squabblers. Twelve for the penitents, and thirteen for the wayfarers. To the Pope, as to the King, they all drink without restraint. Now, I just kind of made up that melody, but I think you get it. For those of us who've played Skyrim or The Witcher, it should be easy to picture people singing with pints or jugs, laughing and kissing and hugging, and maybe even some friendly punches. Now, imagine breaking lyrics like this out with your friends at the pub. There may be slaps, dirty looks, and perhaps you might even get thrown out of the bar. But hey, at least we're all having a good time, right? A good drinking song is difficult not to sing while swinging around your favorite pint or jug, but now it's time to just see how warp becomes beer. The Croissant describes the foamy head that develops as beer begins to ferment. 
Inside the carboy, multiple generations of yeast are eating the sugars, reproducing and building a long-lasting society of little dancing particles, at least in yeast years. The croisin can last anywhere from 4 to 7 days and usually forms in between 24 to 48 hours after the yeast was pitched. Just remember that when storing the carboy vessel, it needs to be in a dark place as light can produce off flavors. Once the croissant finally settles, you can technically keg or bottle the beer right away, but I have other plans. And before we get to them, let's dance a little more and talk about how you can pair beer with good music. One surprise for you could be that the different beer styles might mean more than just the taste, feel, aroma, etc. In research done by Felipe Reynoso Carvejo, a researcher in Brussels with a PhD, it was published that types of music might enhance certain types of beer styles. In a piece published in Frontiers of Psychology with the Brussels Beer Project in an English music group called The Editors, they developed a porter inspired by the indie rock and identity of the band. The beer they made was infused with Earl Grey tea to add citrus notes to complement the malty chocolate flavors usually associated with a porter. People were then given the beer to taste without labels. Some drank with music, others drank in silence. It was discovered that the people who drank the porter with the music actually found it better tasting than those who didn't listen to music at all. And for those who already knew the band's music already and picked up on it, they mentioned that they actually liked the use of multiple senses when it came to listening to the music and drinking the beer at the same time. This research had Calvejo come up with a hypothesis that rock music pairs better with malt beers and a roasted grain flavor and that also contains sweetness, spice, and or chocolate. Other findings in this research suggests different beer and music pairings as well. Drinking an amber pilsner or fruit beer? Try oldies, folk, country, or classical music. Enjoying a hoppy beer? Try to listen to reggae, ska, or dub. Have that perfect sour? Try to listen to grunge or math rock or even punk. Have a strong beer with a high alcohol content? Bust out the new wave tunes. What about hip-hop, dance, downbeat, or electronica? It wasn't really mentioned in the research. My thought is listen to the beat. Some songs have similar time signatures and even sample from other music. Uh, in my mind, these genres of music might be the most versatile for these beer pairings. And while a lot of this has variables, as someone into music and beer myself, I kind of want to do my own experiment and see what I should be drinking at the next concert I go to. Maybe I'll do a video down the line about that. Of course, others are already doing this. In an NPR article titled The Classical Kegerator, Pairing Beer with Music, author Aaron Sherman wanted to see which classic tracks paired well with beer. For example, he has Bessie Smith, Give Me a Pigfoot, and a Bottle of Beer, paired with PBR, or Paps Blue Ribbon. Another song, George Solti's Edgar Pulp and Circumstance, March No. 1, paired with Boddington's Pub Ale. How fun would it be to create a panel every week and drink different styles of beer, listen to different types of music, do this for a year, compile the findings at the end? Sounds like a great club, no? When thinking what kind of music I'd pair this Scotch Ale with, I keep coming back to one band, one I just discovered. Gravedigger has a Scottish heavy metal band with epic songs, because this beer is going to be epic. I assume this would be a great brew for a Highland Farewell. So now we get back to the secondary rack here. I'm putting this into another fermentator. And of course, uh, what? why? Why would I need to do this? Uh, it technically is ready to put into a bottle and carbonate after the Krausen settles. So at this point, it, it's technically beer, not wort anymore. It is very true. But by aging the beer for another month in a secondary vessel, it helps mature the beer. Uh, we are removing dormant yeast as well, but it also helps remove unwanted flavor compounds gives a good mouthfeel to the beer. Uh, it helps with a cleaner finish on your palate when you finally do get to bottling this. So let's get going, let's rack this guy.
And as you can see, we've now moved the beer to a five gallon vessel with the sediment being left out from the primary, but we aren't done yet. Next, we'll add some more hops to give added aroma and flavor as this beer sits for another month before I bottle it. Before I add these hops though, I thought it was a good time to talk about the connection that society has had with music and beer. Music and alcohol have gone hand in hand in society for a long time and beer is certainly in that conversation. We've already mentioned the communal ritual of drinking songs and how some beer pairs with certain types of music. This is all about using multiple senses to turn a normal experience into a memorable one. Think about it. What do you remember most fondly about a time you went out with friends? Just a drink? Or is it the conversations, the laughing, the singing, the act of seeing new things or touching or even tasting? This is maybe why people like to try new beers at pubs and breweries but not so much when they get home when they like to stick to their staples or the things they like most in our modern society the connection could be seen at music festivals that might have limited release beers or how state and city events might have a stage and a beer tent together but what about history well it turns out that social drinking might have had an impact on our evolution this goes back to the historic archaeological digs mentioned in previous episodes this season. Evidence of early brewing from the Gobekli Tepe have created hypotheses about how Stone Age men and women would have times where they feasted and drank a lot. There's evidence of large gatherings for solstice, theories of big celebrations at Stonehenge, and the new discoveries show that communities were making a lot of beer. As we started to become social primates who used thought and reasoning to innovate and create tools, we suddenly started to stop wandering and created villages and cities. We started to farm instead of hunt and gather. And of course, this also meant the society started to become more challenging. Beer continued to play a role here because it generally plays a role in generating happiness and well-being when not abused. An evolutionary biologist, Professor Robin Dunbar of Oxford University, said that the practice of social gatherings with feasts and alcohol can go back hundreds, thousands of years when we learned about how to use and control fire and how even nomadic tribes interacted with others to trade and exchange knowledge. He said the act of telling jokes, singing, and just being social creatures release endorphins that make a positive experience, and for those that participate together, bonds are formed. I don't know about you, but beer and music seems to be at the root of many of my friendships. And it could be why we all still get excited to participate in karaoke, despite half the bar sounding like Chewbacca choking on powdered donuts, and the other half resembling Elmer Fudd sitting on a juicer. I've drunk many delicious brews at music festivals, and it is certainly a part of the stories that I tell. Uh, while the music obviously is very important, uh, I think that the beers tasted in the experience of going to these music festivals are almost just as important. But yes, the music makes us groove while the beer makes us not care what people think of our dancing. As we said before, the yeast likes to dance in the fermentation vessels. Uh, so let's give it a partner now. Eight ounces of Fuggles Hops. Uh, dry hop in this guy. I, I'm using pellets here because when I purchase these, uh, you know, living in Minnesota, cold winters, it's hard to get the full flower hops at the point when I purchase them. Even now, to be honest, it's hard to get those. But I, while I prefer those, the pellets get the job done. They do just as good of a job. Um, you know, maybe not as aesthetically pleasing, but uh, time to smell the goodness uh, here. Fuggles with a woody and earthy uh, kind of note profile to your nose when, when you're smelling them. Oh, and, and that kind of spiciness should go very well with this Scotch export ale that I'm making. Now, before we close out this final process until we get to bottle this beer in a month, let's discuss the science behind how music influences beer's sensory experience can music do for beer we already have research on how beer can taste better with the right tunes coming out of our speakers but could vibrations from music possibly affect the beer before it is even ready to be bottled or tapped according to an article in 1962 in hilgardia a journal of agriculture and science published by the california agricultural experiment station they looked into the effect of music on spirits such as whiskey and also in wine 
The article references a 1903 article about how if a storage cellar was around heavy traffic or other vibration producing conditions, it affected the aging process. In London, for example, wine stored in cellars built under railway arches were shown to become clearer quicker than wine stored in other cellars. The same article also discusses the vibrations from sound waves as affecting the beverage treatment, agitation to get the yeast going. Depending on the frequency of the sound, there could also be a dispersion of particles or changes in temperature and pressure that could have different chemical effects. Not all of that could be good for some styles of beer, but on the other hand, it might be, as there has been research done on how certain uses of ultrasonic waves can actually speed up the aging process. In fact, it must be closer to reality than we might know, as some processes for sonic and ultrasonic treatment to accelerate aging processes has already been patented. When barrel aging, the application of ultrasonic and sonic waves are considered to be beneficial for whiskeys, brandies, rums, liqueurs, and to some extent, wines, cider, champagne, and beer. We do have some modern examples of beer being fed sound waves during the fermentation process as well. New Zealand Brewers Garage Project made a batch of beer and called it Dark Resonance IPA. For fun, they decided to make the beer even darker by playing non-stop black metal and doom metal as it fermented. They actually put speakers and equipment in the stainless steel fermenting vessels. They even have a video of the head banging bash created for the yeast while they consumed all the sweet sugars in the wort. The head brewer of the project, Pete Gillespie, said afterward that while technology was killed in the project, the yeast actually fermented more than it usually would. We believe that more hop flavor was present, despite a subtle dry hop that they tried to do. The funny thing is that the batch was their 666th, and it cost, you guessed it, $6.66 when it came out. Yes, sometimes dark beers need to be darker. Where we're going, we don't need eyes to drink, only ears. And we're back. What a ride we've been on so far. Just one more episode to go with the bottling of this beer and the first sip all to come next week. Not sure about you, but I'm very excited to taste this finished product. Join me in the season finale when we discuss the history of Oktoberfest. And of course, I do like to taste the beer throughout all the processes. So this is the beer uh, as it came out of the primary, uh, obviously not carbonated, but uh, it'll give me a good idea of what it will taste like later when it's finished. So until next time, salut.